Thank you, and thank you for hanging on. I know I'm keeping you from the beer, so uh, I will try and be quick. Up and down is there. Nope, this isn't my presentation, that's the wrong way. Okay, <clears throat> so today we have the riveting topic to finish the day on. We're looking at the use or reuse of existing software in Misra C, which I always get to talk about, and ISO 262. And the reason I get to talk about this, as some of you know, I have the, the privilege of being the current chair of the Misra C activities, and as the colleagues that have just talked about Autozar, Misra C effectively maps into your Autozar classic domain, and Misra C++ maps to the Autozar adaptive, where Autozar have then moved on a little bit further. So what am I going to talk about? Firstly, some of you may have seen the first couple of slides, but I do it anyway. Quick history of where Misra came from. About Misra C in the 26262 context, Misra compliance, which is, in many ways, that's the important bit. How do you tick the boxes that go to your safety case and say, I am Misra compliant? That then leads into dealing with the legacy existing, or as we call it, adopted code. So very quickly, because I only have 20 minutes, the C language first came around 1972. It was written in Bell Labs by Dennis Ritchie basically to write the Unix operating system. That's effectively why it was created. But it's been used a whole lot more since. But only a few years later, the same people in the same university realized actually the C language had a lot of problems. So they created Lint as a static analyzer of C code. And then 1978, the book we perhaps all know and love, or maybe just know, the C programming language. Mr. Koenig and Ritchie's epic book that has sat on many shelves. 1989, lots of development, lots of parallel tracks, lots of complete incompatibility, but we still called it C. We tried to bring it together and we created a standard. Originally led by the Americans, hence ANSI C. But it didn't say, stay as ANSI C for long. Only a year later, that was fast tracked through as an ISO standard. C90, perhaps the most commonly used version, even now. That went through some increments, and these are all through a standard process. So theoretically, the language is, is close to being consistent, irrespective of the implementation. More on that later. So 2000, uh, sorry, 1999, there was a fairly big update. C99 is probably now the heart of most common compilers. C11 added a whole load of crud, to put it bl uh, bluntly, stuff that most of us really, really don't use, and hence the current version of Misra basically says, just don't use it, and very few people complain. 2018 was a little update. They called it a TC, but actually snuck in a few changes that most people didn't notice. And all being well, next year maybe, or 2023, will be the next version and that will add a whole load of new features, new if you're a C programmer. A lot of them already exist in C++. So that's all good. But some, you can tell I've got used to doing this on Zoom, because when in the past I've asked, how many of you say you're using ANSI C? And lots of people put your hands up, and I go, I bet you're not. So C is still, despite the increasing use of C++, the most commonly used programming language in the embedded sphere. But the ISO standard itself is incomplete. And if there's any in the room that are on the ISO working group for this, you know I get quite heated. If that standard was your requirement spec in a day job, you'd send it back. The standard has lots, of, sometimes I actually have the numbers here, but I don't today, where the standard says, in this circumstance, 
the behaviour is undefined. That is, we're not telling you what the standard language should do. There's just as many where it says the behaviour is unspecified. Again, it can do anything and be standards compliant. Then there's the ultimate kludge we have implementation defined behaviour. And what that means is your compiler can largely do whatever it wants as long as the documentation tells you what it does. So in theory, it, any of these undefined, sorry, implementation defined behaviours could say, in this condition, I will wipe your memory. That would still be standards conforming if it was documented. Hopefully, none of the good compilers do that. <clears throat> now, over and above all of that, there's still the fact that C is an appalling language if you really want to play games. You can go to Stack Overflow. They have a whole forum for people to write and, and demonstrate their clever code. And I genuinely say, if ever I have somebody applying for a job, I do check on Stack Overflow to see if they're on there. And I've had some interesting interview conversations with people and say, oh, I see you've put this example up of, of your code. I hope you're not going to do that if I employ you. The language equally, there's, there's things that people think they know, but actually they don't. A common one is the behaviour of 8-bit integers, or chars as C calls it. If you do arithmetic on those, you actually end up with integers, by definition, in the standard. Most people just ignore that fact and continue as if they've got their unsigned char. Most of the time it works, sometimes not so. And of course C doesn't do error checking. One of the great things of, of ADA is you do something slightly wrong, it tells you about it. C allows you to shoot yourself in the foot. So we've got all these, so why are we using C? If we've, if we've got all these problems, you know, some people, Rod Chapman's not here, he's normally here, and he says, use ADA! And that is one option. Unfortunately, there's not that many ADA programmers out there, which is why we still use C. So what can we do about it? Well, we've got Misra. Bit of ancient history, 1994, before my time. Development guidelines for vehicle-based software. Now, these are what are officially known as the Misra guidelines. People say Misra C is the Misra guidelines. But no, these were written way back when. And the MISRA group was actually formed at the same time as NMI, the same government-funded project. Now, that was published 1994. And the people involved with that thought, actually, C would be a good thing. So 1998, MISRA C came on scene. And it was called Guidelines for the Use of the C Language in Vehicle-Based Software. Around that time, I had my first argument with a defence company who told me that Misra C was irrelevant for their works, it's purely an automotive spec. We've recently been to them and sold our C tool to that same company, particularly with the Misra add-on. So they've finally woken up. And just to complete the timeline, 61508, the grandfather of all the functional safety standards, was published in December 1998. 26262 was still twinkle in people's eyes at this stage. Although the original MISRA guidelines did form a big input to them. So things don't stay the same. MISRA C, compatible with C90. 2004, notice the title change. One of the first questions we got asked back in whenever was, what is the MISRA equivalent for the medical systems world? Because they wanted, and we said, well, what's wrong with Misra C? Ah, oh, but that's for vehicle software. It says it on the cover. So the next version, we changed that. A little paradigm shift, but it, it showed the change of thinking. And then 2012, actually it was January 2013, but we'd published, you know, we'd done the hard cover before we actually finally published it. 
<coughs> and then in 2019 there was an update of that to add in some additional officially we called it the security updates but actually it was more of just some things we'd, we'd missed now 26262 context where does this all fit together now i'm assuming because you're here we're automotive e-ish and we have to worry about those numbers so the standard itself says we've got to specify criteria for, you can read it on the screen, and cite MISRA-C is a coding guideline that does this. Now, it's quite useful in that quite a few of us from MISRA were involved with 26262. That is not a coincidence. So MISRA-C, they're in the standard as good practice. For this 2018 version, we ummed and ahed as to whether we ought to say or Misra C++, but that's a bit legacy and we haven't quite got the next version done. So maybe the next version will cite C++ as well. And that table that's referred talks about things that we ought to be doing in our coding standards. In many ways, this is a bit motherhood and apple pie. Hopefully, we're doing these anyway. We shouldn't need a standard to tell us to have less complex code, use subsets, etc., etc. But unfortunately, the evidence is we do need to tell people to do it. One beyond there is user language subset. Well, that's what MISRA C is. You know, pure and simple, it's a subset that tries to stop all the rubbish in C that you could do that you really, really don't want to. So moving on a bit further into the standard, I've had to type the text because the way it is in the book, it's a bit rubbish. So a whole load more what you ought to be doing when you're writing the code. And the table that it refers to there at the bottom is Misra C tells you how to do all of this. So in two of the key design and process parts of 26262, it is effectively telling you Misra C is the way that you should be going. We start looking at the testing, and okay, the, the first few items, they're options. You know, you don't do all of walkthrough, pair programming, inspection. You know, as you move up the ACLs, they change. But most of these, and on the other tables, are all highly recommended, especially in the ACL Cs and Ds. So you really ought to be doing these unless you've got a good reason not. And you know, one F, G, and H, the three I'll drag out, control flow analysis, data flow analysis, and static code. That is the hub of what MISRA C brings to the game. And we're now into the integration test. Again, they link together. A key point to note here is in the two parts of 26262 that deal with your, your verification, it effectively splits into the the unit test and the integration test. And that maps in MISRA terms to what we call the single translation unit, a unit test, and the system-wide guidelines. So again, the mapping is there. So that's a very, very quick run through the history of where we've got to. Okay, now, hot topic is MISRA compliance. And, you know, if I had a pound from every person that told me, of course we're MISRA compliant on their project, I wouldn't be stood here today, I'd be sunning myself in the Bahamas. So what is MISRA compliance? Well, way back since the dawn of time, we've had guidance in MISRA C that tells you what you need to do to be MISRA compliant. It's actually there. People don't read it. I mean, Chris Hills, in, when he does his presentations, often refers to MISRA C like the Kama Sutra. It's got six chapters at the front that nobody ever reads and they just go and read the pictures. In Misra C, they just look at the rules. And we know this because there's a whole load of stuff at the front that we get people asking questions about. In the rule, it says this, and we say, yes. Have you read that bit at the front? No. Go and read that. Oh, yeah, I see. We were approached um, in 2015 by a national automotive body, not UK, who may have just come out of a very large legal case in America, uh, and basically they wanted some guidance of how to achieve compliance and to manage deviations. And 
what we did is we said, well, oh, compliance is there in the front. Yeah, we want more than that. So we took that guidance and produced a new book. So what does it cover? Well, you can get it as a freebie download, by the way. You don't have to pay for this. That link may not work because we've just refreshed the miserable website, so I need to check. So what is miserable compliance? Well, it tells you what we mean and what you need to do to demonstrate it. A new thing that we've added is a mechanism for tailoring the guidelines. Previously, they were advisory required mandatory, and if you didn't like that, tough. We now provide a mechanism to, to recategorize. More on that in a minute. We provide some guidance on what to do with adopted code. That's what we call. We give better guidance on deviations, and we introduce what we call permits, which is a way of suppliers and, and uh, end users agreeing on scope for deviations early, rather than waiting to the end and, nope, we don't agree with that. So what is compliance? It's not organisational. So it's based on a deliverable item and specifically a version of a deliverable item. And it's not really the software itself, but the process to the, the way of achieving it. Okay. Importantly, it does not mean no deviations. So if you have a QA manager that says, I want 100% misery compliance with no deviations, please send him to me. It means you've not resolved all your violations. And it's achieved when? It's blurby there. It's basically, here's a process, follow it, do it. Or as Roger Rivette used to say, engage brain, keep it engaged. So we're heading into the core of the last bit. I know we don't have much time. What is adopted code? Or legacy code? Or existing code, whichever you use. Basically, it's stuff that already existed. Simple as that. But the key, as far as we're concerned with, with the compliance, is as soon as you start editing that code, it's no longer existing code, it's now project code. And I've had people try and tell me, oh yeah, you know, this, this piece of software we've, we've reused from 10 years ago's project, we've only rewritten half of it, so it's still legacy code. No. As soon as you change it, all the rules apply. Sometimes the deviation is justified. Sometimes. You know. In which case, let's deal with it. Sometimes the way of dealing with it is to fix the code. Sometimes there are legitimate reasons to keep that violation in the code. So a deviation isn't just documentation, we have a problem. It's we have a problem, we want to keep it, this is why, these are the consequences, these are the mitigations that we're, we're doing. Right, I said previously the rules were advisory man required and mandatory fixed. Some people wanted to change that. So we said, okay, we'll give you a process for doing it. So you cannot downgrade a mandatory rule. That's a slightly defeat point. And you cannot lower a required rule. What you can do is you can move a required rule up, you can move an advisory rule up. But actually the step that has proven most popular is we now apply legitimately to disapply advisory rules. What happened in the past is actually people just ignored the advisory rules, pretended they didn't exist. So what we've done is we've brought that into scope and say, if you don't want to do that advisory rule, justify it. Don't just pretend it doesn't exist. And you can check your code manually. I'm going to fast forward this because I want to get to the last couple of slides. You, know, you can use a good tool. <clears throat> so, what is adopted code? I'll put this up. It's here just to remind you. I'm not going to go through it again. So it's any existing code. Now, in the context here, we're talking 26262. This is the software lifecycle as defined in the standard. It's a V model, but 
as the previous speaker showed, actually there's nothing in 26262 that says you have to use a V model. That's an example. You can use Agile. You can. The important part is if you use Agile, you still have the outputs to produce. You know? Yep, okay. But the important part here is with your existing code is you have this box down there. So what you need to make sure is, particularly in your VMV, is you have to do the right-hand side of this graph. So I'll stop at that point. I do have a couple more slides to go on, but I think that's the, the point to remember, is that even if you are using existing code, if you haven't got all the bits down the left-hand side, that's perhaps not such a big worry, but you need to remember to do that right-hand side because that is what goes in your safety case that says to your regulator, your type approval, this is fit for purpose. So I'll pause it there. Apologies for running over. Thank you. Go and enjoy your beer.